Welcome to Listen MKE Live. I'm James Causey, Projects Reporter with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and a 2019-2020 Marquette University O'Brien Fellow. I'm currently in the midst of a project called Milwaukee's Promise, where I look at solutions to some of the city's nagging issues. So far, I looked at good programs that started in Milwaukee, but either stopped due to a lack of funding or support. And as a result, we sort of lost our vision and always seem to be starting over. And with the city in crisis mode and people sick and tired of being sick and tired, the time now is to act. Recently, my project tackled the issue of housing, and I suggested that the city strongly consider moving to a regional approach to maximize our housing dollars to get more families into safe and affordable housing. As you well know, housing plays a key role in a child's academic success, a family's stability and emotion, emotional well-being. Those stories can be seen on jsonline.com. Today's vision board event came together through Listen MKE. The event is the outgrowth of the Journal Sentinel's Milwaukee's Promise Project. It was reported with generous support from Marquette University Dietrich Fellowship in Public Service Journalism and the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. Listen MKE Live is a collaborative effort of the Journal Sentinel, WWM 89.7 Milwaukee's NPR, the Milwaukee Public Library, and Milwaukee PBS. Before I introduce the talented community leaders, let's hear a few words from Darlene Russell, Director of Neighborhood Engagement at the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. Thank you, James. Good afternoon, and I am so excited to be here. Again, Darlene Russell, and I serve with the Greater Milwaukee Foundation as the Director of Community Engagement. Uh, just a little about the uh, foundation. For more than 100 years, uh, we have been dedicated to strengthening Milwaukee. Um, as a community foundation, we are a giving organization. Uh, we give in different ways. Uh, we invest in effective programs um, and nonprofits. Uh, we help generous people support causes uh, that they care about. Um, and one of my favorite is really amplifying the voices in the community and bringing the community together to identify priorities and design solutions with shared leadership. Um, in our work, we see real issues that face, face real people. And like many of you, we are living um, and experiencing the issues as we work on uh, to mitigate them. Um, we, also, we also see uh, root causes on those issues and understand in order to arrive at a collective solution uh, that we need to have a collective understanding. Uh, that is why uh, the foundation has supported the Journal Sentinel's uh, Milwaukee Promise Series uh, through a fellowship in public service and journalism. Um, I am a fan of Jane Causey. Um, um, it's exciting to see that uh, James and Angela Peterson um, is channeling uh, their vision and talent of journalism uh, through storytelling, um, explaining the realities of systemic uh, racism and exploring solutions. Uh, James may not realize this, but we go way back. I spent a lot of time on 39th and Sarno. We have a, a, a common friend, Tony Daniels. Um, in common. So I've been a, a fan of James Causey when I read his articles, whether it's in the Journal Sentinel or um, on Facebook, um, a, a story about his family. It just comes to life. And for me, it's like I'm right there. Uh, that's what makes uh, this uh, project so exciting. Um, earlier, I mentioned um, we believe in amplifying the voices, and that is what this project uh, does. And it perfectly aligns with the work that we're doing. Um, and I'm excited to say that um, as part of the visioning board um, process, uh, we will be providing kits to some of our residents in the neighborhoods where we focus um, our investments on. And so um, I'm happy to be here, happy to share. And I want to turn this back to James. Well, thanks a lot, Darlene. And I will be remiss if I didn't mention my partner in on this uh, event, uh, Angela Peterson, who's a photojournalist who will do who's taken a lot of video and photos for this project as well. So um, I just want to say thank you to Angela Peterson. Uh, for those listening, you can also participate as well by submitting your vision boards to jsonline.com backslash MKE vision. 
We will be picking the best of these vision boards and highlighting them at a future event. So please stay tuned for that. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Natalie Hayden, Camille Mays, Amani Ray, Montel Ross, Jeremy Triblett, and Venus Williams. They will be discussing their vision boards and where they would like to see the city headed over the next year to 18 months from now. Um, but first, uh, we want to start with Jeremy Triblett, founder of Anaptu Training and Presentation Design, who we filmed earlier today. And now we're going to go to Jeremy Triplett, founder of Anepto Training and Design. Uh, first of all, Jeremy, tell me a little bit about yourself. How are you doing, James? Thank you for having me on uh, this platform. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm Jeremy Triplett. I am the founder of uh, Anapto. Anapto means to light a flame or kindle a fire. My work is really centered around creating learning environments um, for people to learn how to be their best selves. Okay, well, take me to your vision board. Yeah. So this is my vision board. <laughs> you can see I had a lot of fun doing that. I grew up as an art student. Um, and so it was really, really tempting to not just create a few things, but to create kind of a cityscape. So you're going to notice the cityscape that I have here. And I'll start in the front um, and then work myself to the purple and then we'll go to orange after that. So okay. for me, James, my vision starts vision starts with accountability. Right. And the reason why I start there is because I recognize that Milwaukee has already started some great work when it comes to anti-poverty, uh, safe places for black families and then equitable, um, equitable resources. But I want to make sure that um, Milwaukee also does a great job of holding itself accountable to not only continuing that work, but getting better at doing that work. So in the front, you'll see that I have anti-poverty. Um, that particular concept for me, it truly means what can we do as a city to ensure that we're eliminating both the risk factors and the conditions of poverty, right? People shouldn't have to um, commit crimes in order to meet their own needs. Instead of us criminalizing people and vilifying people, um, we should also look at what are the conditions that create the need for people to meet their needs in ways that are not as productive, right? And so really understanding the anti-poverty for me, it really means starting with a lens of empathy and it really connects itself to equitable resource distribution. Um, so anti-poverty for me has is the tallest fear. Um, not only that, but poverty itself has so many impacts on our minds, on our children, on our families, people not being able to get to work, not being able to meet their needs, and then looking to cope with those things, potentially with drugs and or crime or something else, right? And so looking at it holistically and saying, what can the city do to not only eliminate people from being poor, but also address some of those uh, risk factors for poverty, and even heal some of that trauma of how we treat people, how we treat people and talk about them when they are poor. Take me to some of the other things on your board. Yeah, so uh, there's anti-poverty in the front. Over at Equitable Resources, that's the orange, okay. um, the orange area. And you'll see, actually, if you zoom in and go down a little bit, you'll see two cars I tried to create. Oh, that's really <laughs> cool. We talk about county contracts and quality education. Um, I wanted to highlight two of our largest institutions um, because they're already doing some of this work, right? We know the county um, has already declared uh, race a, 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 an emergency. Right. Uh, racism, a, a health, public health crisis. Yes, a public health crisis. And we see that NPS is also doing some work to reduce the amount of young people of color that they're suspending and or reprimanding disproportionately, right? And so once again, we're talking about accountability. And so I recognize that we've, we've already noticed these things, but now what I'm saying is how can we hold each other accountable to doing these things long term, right? When trauma and racism and anti-racism are longer, no longer a buzzword, we want to make sure we are electing and hiring and listening to people from all different races, all different backgrounds to really add to what it, what it can look like for us to distribute resources, rather it be academic resources, rather it be um, financial resources, neighborhoods, in a way that really builds us all up. Quickly take me to the other part of your uh, vision board. Yeah. And so we know that for a long time, we have been considered the um, worst place to raise a black child. And I'm just like, I don't, there's so many things connected to that. A part of it is the fact that many African-American families exist in poverty and that 
Um, a lot of us don't actually have a lot of resources that being distributed with equity. Um, and so I wanted to highlight that in this continuum of conversation and say, you know what? Our goal should be the safest place to raise Black children. Um, and that is going to be important for us to support Black parents. It's going to be important for us to change the way that we see Black families and representation and leadership as well. Well, Jeremy, thanks a lot. That's a great board. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you, James. Next, we're going to go to Natalie Hay Hayden, co-founder of Exposed, the podcast. Natalie, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, James. How are you? I'm good. Tell me a little bit about who you are. My name is Hayden. I am I'm a co-founder of Expose the Podcast, a podcast where we talk about life after abuse. And when we talk about abuse, it's not necessarily domestic abuse, but it can be abuse from childhood, abuse from, um, you know, things that we may have experienced within our communities or the trauma that we may have experienced um, in a church or so forth. So life after abuse, meaning that, you know, you can really be intentional about creating the life that you want even after trauma. So um, I also serve for the city of Milwaukee um, as a commission chair, uh, vice chair, pardon me, and we work with domestic violence and sexual assault. So the work is pretty much aligned with um, eliminating or reducing domestic or violence in the city of Milwaukee. Great issues. Take me to your vision board. All right. So my vision board, I mean, I'm so excited when when you when I had the opportunity to create this vision board. Um, my life has really unfolded in such a way because of the the um, the theme of vision boards throughout my life. I think without a vision, we can perish, and without a vision, we are lost. So the time frame for someone to see um, a turnaround can really be detrimental to like how they vision their life. And I think of the vision board for the city, it has to be personal. We have to take this vision board and internalize it for ourselves. What do I envision for myself as an individual? What do I envision for my, my family? What is it that I envision for my community? And then here it is, we're at the city. So I'm going to start with there are four pillars that I highlighted um, for my vision board. And it's really education, uh, humanity, uh, health, and business or justice. So um, I'll start with education. And I think that education um, is really important in terms of, you know, because I have a child, I have a black child at that. And, you know, there are some things that are just not um, met, unfortunately. But if you can see in the center of the board, all four pillars, it requires us to focus on accountability. Um, the last presenter, we all have a common thread of accountability. So there is a level of accountability that you have to hold yourself as well as, um, you know, these individuals that hold these high places within the educational system, right? So, um, you know, when we talk about poor housing, gentrification, there has to be accountability there. First of all, the accountability that I take for myself before I can ask the city, to be mindful of that is to be educated. We have to find ways to educate ourselves on what is gentrification. How do I become um, a homeowner versus a renter? You know, what are laws? What are some laws in place that have prevented us or that um, keeps us, you know, in this renting position and so forth? So those are some things that I really have taken personal myself. What I'm asking for the city on a vision board. Um, aspect is nothing that I have not taken personal myself or that I, I've attempted and I continue to do the work for, right? So um, when we talk about the dream of, you know, having a home, there comes, you know, there are some things that have really prevented us as a community. And I don't want to say Black people, just Black people, but I think that as a whole, you know, our city has really suffered with, um, you know, just holding one another accountable and allowing opportunity for all people. Um, as you go down to, um, I think it's the left, 
right hand yes we still have account unaccount we have accountability that is still the focus that you know we have to look at the injustices that are around us and we have to literally hit that on the nail and what is that what is that in our city our city specifically what is defunding we need to break down what is defunding to us does that mean funds are allocated somewhere else and then if they are where are those funds going to be allocated to so we have to make sure that we are aware of what those injustices are and work collaboratively work collectively and make sure that we're all aligned. Everyone has a role in this vision, right? So it's not just one person and it's not just one person that can do the job. There's many of us that have been gifted to ensure that the vision is, you know, um, that the vision continues to move forward. And sometimes it requires us to pass the baton. When we talk about accountability, um, there are some individuals that have been in places for a very long time and now it's time to revisit, you know, if this person serves a purpose for our city any longer, you know, and it doesn't matter what role that is. And so um, as I go over to the last point of the pillar from uh, my vision board, it's health disparities. Exactly. And I take health very seriously. It's not just, you know, um, the community that's responsible for my health. I have to take accountability for my health. And what does that look like? And I understand that there are some of us that have been born, um, the cards have not been dealt in our favor. However, we have everything at our fingertips and you can learn, you can self-educate. There's no reason why, you know, we shouldn't know what a food desert is or why we should know, you know, how often we should have greens or it's better to drink water over, you know, sugary beverages, you know, so there's an accountability that I have to take for my health. And then there's another level of accountability where we have to hold our health um, departments and community uh, health care facilities intact as well, too. That's fantastic. And you hit on a lot of key uh, issues that I talked about in, in the series so far. You know, a, a lot of people don't realize this, but you know, 50 years ago, the black homeownership rate was higher then than it is today. And we need to really address those kind of issues. But this is a fantastic vision board and accountability is a must in all those phases. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, I would like to go to Camille Mays, founder of the Peace Garden Project MKE. Camille, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Good, good, good to hear you. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, um, my name is Camille Mays. For anyone who doesn't know, um, I do. Um, I I hold the title of community activist, advocate, community organizer. Um, I have a lot of different things I work in. Um, I work with police community relations, healing, community building, and most or a lot of people know me from working with families on homicide victims and doing um, peace gardens. And I recently had my own tragedy um, when my son, my 21 year old son, Darnell, and so brought my focus and my purpose even dear as I move forward with my work. And we, we the community mourns your loss. Um, let, let's, you. you know, and, and I really mean that you, you do a lot in this community and, and we should applaud you for, for the work you do. Um, let's go into your vision board. And so it's a lot going on on my vision board, but I really want to focus on some of the things that, um, everybody so far hasn't. Um, one thing I just want to say is that moving forward, I think that, um, we have to do some of the things that I have on the board. So from working grassroots and working with people from the top to the bottom, these are the things that I came up with uh, for changing the city. First, we need to respect and have a little more love in the village mentality and bring that back. And I think that the community, the police in the city of Milwaukee need to come more together on a lot of things. And if anybody can see that bright yellow, it says pay the organizers. Um, that's a huge problem in the city. If you look at 2015 up until recently, the homicides that went down each year 
from 2015 and they spiked up tremendously this year since we've been in um, the pandemic. So my thoughts, and I want to get this out to everyone in the city, is that the MPD and the city of Milwaukee cannot do it alone. When the community outreach was limited and the organizers were limited in the work and the outreach they could do, you saw homicide spike, you saw um, suicides, domestic violence spike. So pay the organizers. We're out here, a lot of experts um, bring us to the table and they don't support us in the work. Just imagine what we can do. Um, and I want to break down, if you go a little over, it says it's mental illness crossed out. I want to shift the mental stigmas that are in our community and in the city of Milwaukee. And I want us to shift the focus and instead of saying mental illness, focusing on mental wellness. I think, um, the healers of the city and the people of the city, it's a lot of tension. And I think a lot of people need to focus on mental wellness in these times. Um, a lot of things we need to support are small business incubators. Uh, you'll see in and out of the vision board, I have voting and ballots because as it was already stated by Natalie, vote is what we need for change. We need people to get out. You know, and so I just want to remind everybody of what we need to do. The city of Milwaukee needs to fix the properties and we need to look at community house options, eco art, transforming the lots into healthy spaces for healthy neighborhoods. And we need to really zoom in on things we can do to stop the violence, which goes back to a lot of what I said already earlier. And the one last thing I want to touch on is the different intersections in this city. That's a whole nother topic, but I would love to see more people coming together from all walks of life, from all identities, from all different cultures, and just breaking all of those barriers to fight where we're all really fighting. You, you hit on something very important that I don't think we talk about enough, and that's paying community organizers. I think a lot of people figure that you just do it out of the goodness of your heart, but it takes money to do that work. It takes funding to do that work. And yeah. I don't think a lot of people think about that. It takes a lot of time and money. And what they don't understand is that a lot of times the cities and big organ organizations call us to the table. They often use our internet. They often use our ideas, but we're not compensated. And people tell people to just go work and just go do stuff, but they have no idea how many hours and how much time, how many people are contacting and, and how big community organizers' hearts are. And I always say it, the people with the passion don't have the funds and the people with the funds don't have the passion. And that's as simply as I could put it. That's deep. Thank you so much for sharing your vision uh, for the city moving forward. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we're gonna move to Amani Ray, a team program coordinator at Peak Initiative. Hey, hey Amani, how you doing? I'm great. I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. So tell me about Amani Ray. Absolutely. Thanks again so much for having me. This is an amazing opportunity. Um, like you said, my name is Imani Ray. I am a team coordinator at the Peak Initiative um, and have done several different things around the community, working with our youth and just building up their leadership. Um, in addition to that, I operate a company called Naturally Beautiful, where my ultimate goal is just to continue to instill the value of self-love into my community, into my peers, and all of those around me to just create this cycle of ongoing messages of self-love. Because I feel like with all these issues that we're talking about, if we can start there within ourselves, within our households, we'll build a, um, a better, more stronger community. Great. So let's talk about your vision board. For sure, for sure. So I've added a little bit since we, um, we last got a few photos of the vision board, but I was really focused on the idea of uh, nothing for us without us. Um, and I was taught that at Urban Underground uh, when I was younger. And there were so many conversations going on about what was best for young people without including them in the conversation. So when I got this opportunity to create this vision board for the vision of Milwaukee, my first thought is like, how can I get my fellow Milwaukeeans a part of this conversation. Um, and as you can see on my vision board, people have a lot to say. Um, and a lot of what they are saying is uh, they have the same vision that I also have for Milwaukee. And I think that's very important for us to really 
take note of the things that people are saying that they need within their community, uh, within their neighborhoods, um, and in Milwaukee as a whole. Um, I, I asked a few more questions following this opportunity and me creating the vision board and tried to get some insight from folks on what it is that they love about Milwaukee, because I think it's important that we come into this conversation from an asset based lens and understanding there are some great things in Milwaukee. So how can we duplicate the greatness instead of spending too much time focusing on the things that aren't going well in our city? So I think about places like the Sherman Phoenix and how amazing and how much of a staple that space has been for our city. Um, collect collaborative economics, when we talk about Sherman Phoenix, the Bronzeville Collective and other spaces around Milwaukee, where they're bringing black owned businesses together um, to, to just make an amazing impact in our city uh, and help those small business owners who don't uh, usually get the support that they deserve and that they need in order to sustain um, within our city. I also, um, got some feedback from folks around the importance and the value of intergenerational conversations. I feel like we just live in a different time where a lot of people talked about accountability and too often we deal with adults who are fearful of young people and won't have a conversation with them and won't get them involved in, in supporting them in their growth. And it reminded me, Ms. Venus is also on this call and I was at the Sherman Phoenix not too long ago and she she uh, stopped me and she was like, oh, we got to take care of that uh, issue that you were having. And that made me feel so warm inside to know that another adult in our community, you know, cared about someone else. Not she's not my family. She's not, you know, she's just someone in the community who cares about other people in the community. And I really, really value that. And I think that's something that Milwaukee needs to, to replicate people in Milwaukee who just genuinely care about other people and want to make a positive impact on uh, everyone's life. So another thing that I uh, noticed that people talked about was just like urban agriculture and making sure that we have, you know, gardens and things like that. And not only have gardens in Milwaukee, that's not the only thing that's important, but educating the, the community and young people on the importance of having um, conversations around urban agri agriculture and having these gardens within our communities and being able to eat healthy foods and I heard, I think it was Natalie who mentioned uh, food deserts and me being able to learn about that in a youth program in Milwaukee at a young age and, and now be able to teach those same things to the young people that I work with in the city um, has been very, very valuable. And I think that's another thing that we should be mindful of is how can we pour into these young people so that they can continue to pour into young people uh, generations to come uh, way beyond the impact that we're able to make right now. Um, another example that I have is just having access, having access to just the bare minimum seems to be an issue here in Milwaukee. Uh, not too long ago, last week, actually, with the Peak Initiative, we hosted a drive-in movie theater um, in the Midtown neighborhood. And so many people were walking by like, what is this? Like, I wish I would have known. I really uh, think that we need to have more things like this in our community. And the community is so hungry for these type of things. And being able to just simply go and hang out in the parking lot and watch a movie is something that they just feel, felt like they didn't have access to. So I think that we should be really mindful about trying to uh, replicate those things. And there's no need to recreate the uh, the wheel. So many people are doing dope things. So figuring out what it is that you can attach yourself to and support um, the continuous growth that is that already exists in Milwaukee is imperative. It's very very important. And I would say for me, I'm always looking at how can I do my part to make Milwaukee look better. I have so many peers, unfortunately, who believe the answer uh, for a better Milwaukee is for them to leave. They don't want to be here. So for me, knowing that that's the reality of so many young people in my life, it's important for me to say, OK, what can I do to change that narrative? What can I do to change their mindset, whether that be include like create continuing to push my brand and uh, push that message of self-love It's also I work with one of my peers and host and open mic nights. Um, we try to do it once or twice a month and get not just young people, but everybody in the community involved to express themselves through art. I think um, having access to art programming and just ways to express yourself creatively, creatively is very important as well. And that's something that I try to make sure I um, am, I'm at the forefront of making sure 
I have I create those opportunities. Not like I said, not only for young people, but for everyone who may need that creative outlet in our city. Well, that's that's fantastic. You hit on a lot of key issues, self love, and really hearing the voices of young people. And I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. For sure. Next, we're gonna to go to Montel Ross, LGBTQ organizer. Montel, how you doing? Yeah, how's it going? I'm good, how are you? Good, good. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure, um, well, I'm Montel Ross, also known as Broderick Pearson. Um, professionally, I am a medical research associate for the Medical College of Wisconsin's Center for AIDS Intervention Research. Um, I'm also the community co-chair for the state's um, HIV Action Planning Group. And I also, Montel Ross is also a drag, male drag persona here in Milwaukee. And I was also the lead organizer over the March with Pride for Black Lives Matter movement, which was a protest demonstration march that gathered about over 3,000 individuals to march in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. Very powerful event too. Thanks for your Thank participation you. in that. Let's talk about your vision board. Sure. Definitely. Um, well, my vision board is a little different. I kind of looked at, well, there's not really too much. Um, I looked at what is Milwaukee going to look like in 2021? And I thought about a game show type of aspect. And it's titled the Milwaukee 2021 Game Show because everyone will not be able to play within this movement. But I think everyone is going to want their opportunity to get a get a get an opportunity to spin the wheel, if I, if I can say that. So I'll start over to the left. Uh, there's been three major things that's impacted 2020 or that is going to impact this year, which is COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement, and now we're in the election um, year for our new president. So the will is, um, I kind of divided it up to kind of touch on all of those matters. Um, I'll start with the COVID effect. Um, what I feel the COVID effect is going to do for 2021, specifically here in Milwaukee, is not only is it going to create a gerber generation, we're going to get a, a heap load of new generational babies coming into the world and they're gonna come in different creeds and colors. But if you notice the pictures underneath the babies, you see pictures of family bonding and things that we see within the commercials um, sometimes during our favorite shows where families are out swimming or they're gathering together to go on a walk or they're doing things within the kitchen. Um, the COVID has actually created a new movement of learning to unify with your families and bonding with your families in ways that may not have been what we have normally paid attention to before COVID-19. It's given people an opportunity to reconnect with their families in ways that I think is going to be powerful for 2021 and give us a sense on what it is to be family embraced and family bonded in a whole new aspect. Um, what it's also is going to do is that it's going to unify different communities that were not unified within this culture or within our, within our city when it has to do, I look at the Black Lives Matter effect. If you zoom in over on there, you see different kids and these kids groups are made up of not just, you see the white kids, the black kids, the Latino kids. Each of these pictures that I chose were pictures that reflected all different cultures within, um, within, our, within our culture, within our community. So you're going to see kids that are just made up of kid groups, not just the black kids or the white kids or the Latino kids or the Asian kids. Families are going to use the Black Lives Matter movement to unite different cultures that have not been united in a way that is needed for our city, that is going to represent our city in a different way. I mean, we know that Milwaukee, specifically Wisconsin, is one of the most segregated states in, in our country, but this, this movement itself is going to lead us in different ways for our generations to come, not our generations now. So I feel that that's going to be a big piece that we'll see happening in Milwaukee for 2021. If you scroll down a little and you see justice for people, I particularly took a lot of time in this area because right now you see, if you notice the young man with the hat sitting on, it seems like he's sitting on the shoulder of the guy with the microphone. And then you see the two black men down in the corner, just dressed as average, just an average day. But what we're going to see is a shift in the imagery of black people. 
We're no longer going to be viewed as criminals. We're no longer, there's going to be a shift in the way that we are viewed um, where it's going to move from a movement of just normal lounge of urban wear to suits and ties and business aspects. You're going to see a powerful voice of a black person that is going to represent justice for people. And it's going to represent justice for people as far as all different cultures, all different types of people within our black community, specifically our LGBT population, our trans population. Um, you're going to see someone or some individuals that is going to be a voice for all of us that is going to speak in unity of all of us and not just parts of us. We're going to learn to unite as a culture and use that, use that unity to provide a voice for the community, if that makes sense. It does, it does, it and, makes a lot of sense. And then if you scroll over where it says knowledge is power, um, and, and yeah, perfect. I feel that, and it's so crazy that um, Joe Biden announced his vice president, his, his vice presidential candidate yesterday, because I feel in 2021, there is going to be a powerful voice for, there's going to be a woman's movement, a black woman's movement. Um, we're giving, and we, now we have Kamala Harris, who is going to be possibly our next VP of the United States of America, but there's going to be a movement for women that is going to be so astounding and so strong, specifically for Milwaukee. And I put the two black men that are known for raising the fist in the Olympics, I put them underneath there as, as representation of powerful black men that is going to uplift these women to be the, the knowledge and the power that we are needed for our culture. Um, if you zoom in on the ball and chains, on the ball, I, I cut out a piece that says, trust black women. I think there is a time where here in Milwaukee, we have to learn to trust our black women. Because for me, I feel that black women are the most powerful beings on our country, and not only in this country, but on our planet. I think they are the movement that is needed for our culture to really grow to the next level, learning for the long run. I think women is going to play a big part. Black women are going to play an intricate part in making sure that our knowledge does become power for our entire community. Okay. And in the center of the piece, and I'll, I'll wrap it up in the center of the actual, um, you see it has a, a wheel, a spin wheel. And it's kind of like you you have three, three spins to flip that wheel and the choice is really yours. The choice is going to be yours if you are willing to step up to the plate and actually experience these particular these particular phenomenals that can happen to our city, or will you be in the middle? And the middle has the free at last with the a lot of what we are dealing with right now. Stop the killing of our culture, black power, melanin power, um, culture movement. We, we're using that to catapult us into a new level of learning, of educating, of growing and uniting as a community. If we don't flip that wheel, we're going to be stuck in that same mindset and we will see Milwaukee, unfortunately, still be in this same state that we're in right now for 2020. So the choice will be yours on if you will grow and allow these different effects that we have went through for 2020 to elevate you into a new growth for 2021. Fantastic, Montel. That's very deep thought, especially uh, the Black women's movement. I think that's been a long time in coming, and we will see something like that happen very, very soon. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Lastly, we're going to go to Venus Williams, Executive Director of Alice's Garden Urban Farm. Hey, uh, she's also my neighbor. So <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Peace and blessings, and thanks for having me today. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your garden. Um, the Alice's Garden Urban Farm, I always like to say, is not mine. Um, it belongs to the community, and there have been so many collaborators who have made that space possible. Um, so it's a farm, an urban farm, that I am gifted and blessed to be able to facilitate. Um, I like to say that I am the key maker, not the gatekeeper, at Alice's Garden Urban Farm. Um, but I'm also an urban minister um, serving in the city of Milwaukee for 31 years. And it's just wonderful um, to be able to share my vision. So let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Cool. 
So I grew up in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, it is a city that has more bridges than any other city in the entire world. Um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has 442 bridges. So as I was being cultivated, as I was being nurtured in who I was birthed to be on the planet, um, I spent almost every day of my life crossing a bridge. As we talk about the question that was posed to us was where do we wanna see um, the city of Milwaukee 12 to 18 months from now? So I want to use a global perspective to, to speak to where um, I want us to be. Those bridges represent bridges from all over the world. I think there is no way that any of us can um, individually as um, human beings or as a city get to where we need to be if we are not um, within a global perspective. So I just wanna name a few things because anyone who knows me um, knows I could go for a long time, but there are just a few things I want to highlight. Um, first of all, when we talk about bridges, we're talking, and I'm using that metaphor um, obviously intentionally, there are some bridges that we need to build in this city, and there are some bridges that need to be dismantled in this city. There are some bridges that used to be um, impactful and effective, and they no longer are. Um, so as we're looking in this moment that we are in, it's a moment of opportunity, no matter how we choose to see it. Yes, we're in a moment of crisis and transition and change in 2020, but more than anything, we should see this as a solutions driven moment. So I wanna talk about, um, there's several, several things that have already been mentioned. I wanna focus in on um, just a few of those things that are also on my um, vision board. I wanna talk about female leadership. Thank you for bringing that up. I, As I look at the city of Milwaukee, um, I look at a city during my 31 years that has been driven um, by males mainly. Um, it is a city that has had consistently male leadership dominant. Um, and so you see, I have that the women of the world must um, be heard. We must hear the voices of women. So in my vision board and in my vision for the next 18 months, I am right here publicly in this moment asking for some of the men who have been in power for a very long time to, to um, relinquish that power, to step back and to understand that if the city um, in, in many aspects is no better than it was when you um, were elected, it's time for you to go. Um, so female leadership and not just black female leadership, but I think that there are solutions um, within a lot of the female leadership and especially women of color who have been bearing the brunt of what is not right um, in this city. I think we have solutions and I think some of those solutions are gonna come not from necessarily women who are already in office, but there are women in our neighborhoods and our communities who need to be strengthened, recognized, empowered and lifted up um, and heard and seen. I would also like to see 12 to 18 months from now, um, each neighborhood, each community. So we have these names um, within our communities. We have neighborhood names. I am calling for um, us as a city to create elder and intergenerational councils for each and every neighborhood that has a name. Um, I am not interested in anyone else solving the problems um, that exist within our communities. The solutions lie within. Um, so I am asking that we as a city um, begin to cultivate um, neighborhood councils, elder councils, intergenerational councils. We'll be announcing ours at Alice's Garden this September. Um, we are announcing an elder council. And in saying that, um, as someone who will be 60 years old next year, I am um, calling out my peers. I am calling out the elders in this community to say it is time to step up. It is time to stop judging um, young folks who are doing the work. It is time to not be afraid of your own children, your own neighbors. Um, and it is time for us as elders to, to come back to the forefront. We've done the work. It's not new work, but it's time to, to renew that work. Um, right now, every night when I go to sleep, I am looking, uh, I'm sorry, I'm listening to on audio, The Warmth of Other Suns. Um, I read the book, but I'm, I'm, I'm revisiting for my own personal challenge and journey, 
the great migration stories of people I don't know, but people I do know because they're people who they may not have the same names, but they nurtured me. And they're the same people who arrived in the city of Milwaukee and wanted to see something different. I'm calling on education. I want to look at what has happened. So the bridge that has been education um, in the city for young children in this neighborhood needs to be dismantled. Um, we need to dismantle this education system that has not served our children right, but there are solutions to be found. I want to see um, every neighborhood again. So I just, I wanna, I wanna use the structures that exist, um, all of these named neighborhoods, and in each neighborhood, I am asking for equity. Um, we also have had a challenge of, of calling out certain neighborhoods and giving certain neighborhoods all of the resources and all of the attention, no more. Um, that, that should have never happened and it does not need to exist. So I wanna see them, every community have a STEAM center. Um, let's talk about what it means for all of these neighborhoods to have a center where young people can go to, to focus on science and technology, um, engineering, art, math, not one, not two, but every single neighborhood. If we have to um, relook at what Mo Milwaukee Public Schools looks like to do this, then we need to do that. And speaking of, um, it has been more than 60 years since we desegregated schools as a country, as an entire country. Um, we said it was time to desegregate schools. If we don't have the courage to look at what has happened in 60 years, what has worked and what has not, then we're missing another opportunity. So I'm calling for the re-examination of the way our school system is structured. I am calling for um, a focused attention again on neighborhood schools. One of the things that happened in the desegregation of schools is that our kids are not going to school together anymore. Therefore, I don't know you, I don't know your mama, I don't know your cousin, I don't know where you work. It is time to look again at what it means um, in education. Um, and lastly, um, I just wanna say right. that as we on, in, on my board, there are things, um, the why can't everyone have a home? Um, cultural survival, it's down further. Um, we talk a lot about housing, but I want to name that one of the things that has come to light within this pandemic is that this whole concept of an emptiness was never our concept as people of color. Um, and this emptiness syndrome that we are in as an American culture has hurt us as people of color and it definitely has hurt um, people who live in the city. We were never a people created to have our own everything, our own house, our own kitchen, our own, our own, our own. Um, I want to see the city um, go to looking at more communal housing. And I don't mean tall towers that house our elders. I'm talking about intergenerational housing. I want to bring um, conversations together, intergenerational conversations where people understand that having community kitchens, and I don't mean to process food in, I mean community kitchens where we are gathering together to cook together, to eat together. Um, the name of my ministry is The Table, a first century style community in the 21st century. What I want to see in 2020, what I want to see today and what I will see tomorrow and tonight um, is people coming back to the table. So reclaiming the things in all of our cultures that were healthy and that were good before we went for the okie doke and bought into okay. this mishap called the American dream. Okay, well, that was, that was fantastic, Venus. But uh, what I would like to do now is bring the group all together so we can have a group discussion and take some questions from, um, from, the face, from Facebook and from the audience. Uh, this was very dynamic. Uh, it was great questions. Um, so one question uh, that came from Facebook from Mary Beth, you can see it right now. How can we help as an individual? The city and state have already are already looking for money. I didn't want uh, to go wanted to go this way to former plans, which have been all talk and committee, but little to no action due to lack lack of funding. So basically, what can an individual do to participate in the process? Anyone can take that. I want to say that it starts at home. Um, it really does start with yourself. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to get 
your families, rally your families around and create a vision board for maybe there's two vision boards in the family. Maybe there's one for yourself and then there's one for the family. And I think that's really where it starts. That doesn't require money. It doesn't, it, it has to start right at home. And that's what we're asking um, when we talk about a plan from 18 months to a year to two years, we're not looking for a sprint. We're looking for a marathon and this is going to take time. So it requires you to be very intentional and thoughtful in that process and what that looks like. And I think what better way to start than with yourself and then to let that feed and uh, be throughout the rest of the family. Um, this is, I wanted to say that I think um, I've been talking to a lot of different people and they've been like, what can they do? What can they do? Uh, it's a lot of different things um, I say to do, but a couple that I want to stress a lot of where we are right now is because like history and the truth really got wiped out. So I would like people to start um, teaching the truth and looking at history and looking at how things really are. And um, I think somebody mentioned it earlier, looking at what worked before and what didn't work before and kind of going from there. And then following um, what work is being done surrounding certain things or people doing those things and like starting there, just looking at the history, what worked, what didn't, who's doing the work, how can we knock some things out? It's some things people can do monetary. It's some things people can do with uh, phone calls, emails, like everybody can't go out and protest, you know, like it's other ways, but just think of what your thing is. And it's so many issues to cover. Just focus on maybe something, start off with something that you're really passionate about. Um, I just wanted to really, really encourage people to do things um, behind the scenes too. Right. Here's another question from Facebook. What's the best way to pay support the organizers and that's from Mary anybody could take it the best way to pay or support the organizers uh, some organizers have organizations but what you find a lot of time is a lot of organizers don't get grants they're asking for donations because they're not established as 501c3s so I think the best way to find out how you can support an organizer is first find out um, if they need donations or what they need you know, if you want to support the organizer, just find out what they need. They might have an event coming up. They might need materials for something. They might need um, monetary donations. But I think first to ask and not to assume, sometimes people assume, just ask. A lot of people don't just ask. It's real. Um, a lot of organizers and people receive people, you know, they don't know how to reach out to us. But a lot of us are easy to find. All they got to do is ask. We are here and I'm sure all of everybody needs something. So I'll speak for everybody on that part. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question for uh, the participants. Uh, you know, I see, I've seen a couple of common themes. One is, you know, safe and affordable housing, mental health, uh, taking over our neighborhoods. Um, those are some common themes, listening to young people, health, which is, which is key to a lot of our problems, healthy foods and things like that. But oftentimes, you know, we, we, we try to get the poorest people to, to, to try to do the most work and come up with the most funds. How, how do we balance that? I mean, you know, I, I've seen a lot of you out there doing the work, but none of you guys are rich. I mean, you don't get rich from doing this. So you know, so when people say, how can we help? Yeah, there's donations, but what does the city and the state need to do to really make sure that we take care of these issues? What would you like to see done? I would think, um, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just chuckled a little bit. The city and the state need to um, acknowledge that the organizers and the people on the ground are the experts. Um, and I'll just be quiet. I'll let Montel go. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, a lot of that has to do with accountability. There is many funds that are allocated within organizations and within even within our administration or within our legislation that it can be used for situations or to better communities. And a lot of individuals or a lot of or, um, organizers like myself or individuals that you said are in the, coming from the community, more of the urban community, we don't have that knowledge to be able to 
hold specific organizations or hold specific people accountable for allocated funds that should be used in the manner that they're being used. Well, when there's individuals out there that know of these specifics and they're educated and they know where these funds and where these opportunities lie, have conversations with individuals that give us the ability to hold these um, organizations or legislation or, or our city or our state accountable for being able to allocate these funds in the right manners. Um, I remember when we did our organizational protest march, that was one of the biggest things that themes that I wanted people to take away is to have communications, open dialogue and communications with people within your norm and people that are not a part of your norm because with education and communication, we find growth and we find knowledge that we didn't have before. And it opens up these doors to give us the opportunities to be able to do these things. Great point. Anyone else wanna comment on that? Yeah, I really think it has um, everything to do with relationships. Um, everything that I have touched in the last three years and continuing to um, move forward and has everything to do with a relationship and how I've cultivated that. I think we have to take a personal assessment of the relationships that we have around us. So look at your circle and then that's where you know, the accountability, the word accountability is so important. You talk about accountability in ways where, you know, we hold ourselves accountable to say, OK, I want to respect my ancestors and go out and vote, become educated enough to know how I'm showing up at the polls. And then when you get to the poll, do you know these people on the state and local uh, level, you know, and how are you holding them accountable? You have to remember they are the people that we have elected, they have to answer to us. And how are we holding them accountable? Are we asking them questions? What type of relationship do I have with Kaylin Haywood, who is my 16th district you know, assembly person? Do you know who that is? Do you have conversations? So I think that it's really important when we talk about accountability, you have to look at relationships on how we can now put ourselves in position to be at the table with these people. So I'm going to say relationships are really important. Yeah, I agree. So um, we have a couple of other questions. Um, one question came from um, community activist Vaughn Mays. And the question really deals with how do we deal with how do younger people deal with elders in the community who tend to want, who see solution as being more police based as opposed to community based? Um, can someone tackle that question? Well, as the elder on the um, panel, I will just say any elder who thinks that you don't have any unlearning to do, um, I would challenge you to not just be an older, but to truly be an elder. Um, things are different and, and change is the only thing that is constant. And so we, you know, I'm constantly educating myself. I'm constantly listening to those who are younger than me and know more than me about certain things. Um, we don't know everything and I don't wanna know everything. And I always want to be learning something. So that just brings me back again to a specific solution of elder councils, which are needed. We have some strong community elders who we're not hearing from enough, um, whether it's that they're waiting for an invitation to a platform or they don't know how to create that platform, but we also need more intergenerational conversations. Um, and I think that's the solution. Communication is the solution. Right. Um, I want to give you each a chance to just go around and say one or two words that, to sum up what, what we need to be uh, 18 months from now. I'll start with you, Venus. Because I muted my mic. Um, we need to be outside of our own individual spaces. We need to be entering into safe space um, places that we can have honest conversations. And we need to pay attention to our neighbors and the solutions that they have, but with no platforms. Thank you. Natalie. 
Um, where I see my, where, where I see this, this, um, our city and the vision in the next 18 years, I see us speaking, first of all, um, more positively about our city. I see us um, being examples within our communities. Um, and then our communities can see it's not about what we say, but it's about what we do. I see us being doers of what, what it is that we're looking for. Um, I see our city collaborating in ways. I see our city being the peer city that other cities are gonna look to because we are so low at this point. We are not together. We're at the bottom of the bear. We are underdogs. And people are gonna say, man, how did Milwaukee do it? If they can do it, we can do it. So I see great things for our city. I see us loving one another. I see us using our voices collectively together. Camille. I want to see more of what we've been seeing. I, I hope to see more of that. I hope to see it intensify. I hope to see more people in numbers. And I, I hope to see more of the shifts. And instead of talking about it, really seeing and feeling it and really um, seeing it take action um, and, and just not meeting the meet anymore. I just want that to end. I'm, I'm tired. And I think a lot of people are just tired. We want to see real change, real action and real shifts. And we want to feel it. Yeah, I agree. Montel. Um, I think we have to be OC. And what I say by OC, we have to be open and we have to be able to communicate. Um, I think those are two of the two of the biggest things that is going to shift and move us in ways that we never thought we can be moved. Open, and that goes in all aspects. You have to be open to be understanding a different part of being black. You have to be open to be understanding a different part of being who you are and communicating with a different culture. You have to be able to communicate in a way that engages conversation. You have to communicate in a way that we talked about holds people accountable. So I think those are the two words that I would use that I would hope that we need to do or that we see within ourselves. We have to be open and we have to learn how to communicate. I agree. Amani. I'm just going to wrap it up with saying my two words uh, for what I want to see in Milwaukee's future is just people getting uncomfortable. So whatever that looks yes. like, everybody is in individuals, simply being able to put yourself in a spot where you're willing to get un uh, uncomfortable, no matter what background or race you are, um, and committing yourself to making an impact uh, in Milwaukee, uh, whatever interest that you have, taking that interest and using your passion to guide Milwaukee in a better direction. Um, and whatever you have to do to just be uncomfortable. Well, fantastic. I just want to wrap it up by saying, telling people to remember that they can participate in submitting their vision boards to jsonline.com backslash MKE vision. We will be picking the best of these vision boards and highlighting them at a future event. You can also continue to catch my series, Milwaukee's Promise on jsonline.com. And I hope that you guys really pay attention to it because it's, it's based on solutions and not really focusing in on the problems. Tomorrow, Venus, I'll let you end it with what we had planned at Alice's Garden. Yes, thank you. So tomorrow between 5 and 8 p.m., you are invited to come to Alice's Garden Urban Farm, 2136 North 21st Street, where our vision boards will be present and we will be present to continue this conversation, for you to see our boards up close and for you to share with us. Um, I'm gonna be there with a notebook and um, a pen so you can share with us what your vision is for the city of Milwaukee. And thank you. Fantastic. Again, I wanna thank our sponsors, the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, Marquette University Dietrich Fellowship and Public Service Journalism and all of, and our other partners as well. This is part of Listen MKE Milwaukee. Thank you.